So once again, hello everybody, happy Monday. Uh, here we are at the Deer Park at the Buddha Center. Uh, let's start out like we normally do, short period of bell meditation. So wherever you are behind your avatar, please get into a nice meditation posture. And as I ring the Ching bell, the idea, focus on the sound of the bell. Really get your concentration going. Really get your deep listening going so you can absorb some Dharma today. Uh, you'll probably get distracted, happens to all of us. Uh, when it does happen, just gently remind yourself and go back to focusing on the sound of the bell. Uh, so after the short meditation, then I'll do the three recitations, and then on with the, the talk for today. So I'll give you a moment, get into a nice posture, and we'll begin at the sound of the bell. I go for refuge to the Buddha, the teacher. I go for refuge to the Dhamma, the teaching. I go for refuge to the Sangha, the taught. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dhamma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I have taken refuge in the Buddha. I have taken refuge in the Dhamma. I have taken refuge in the Sangha. Three pure precepts. Cease to do harm. Do only good. Do good for others. Bodhisattva vow. However innumerable all beings are, I vow to lead them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are, I vow to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are, I vow to master them all. However endless the Buddha's way is, I vow to follow it completely. Swaha. All right. So again, greetings, everybody. So the talk today is called Self-Help Awakening, or I like to call it the return of Sid. Uh, so here we go. 
Greetings, and welcome to the Deer Park at the Buddha Center in Second Life. It is a beautiful virtual place, and I am happy to be here. My name is Sid. I am awakened, and I want you to be awakened, too. All right, all right. I already see you guys turning and looking at your neighbors. You look confused. You're thinking about yourself. You think, wait a minute, I'm awake. And you look around at the people around you, you know, your neighbors, the people sitting next to you, and you go, well, they don't appear to be asleep either. Well, yeah, you are awake, but are you awakened? Today, I come here and I'm going to offer each of you the opportunity to, to become aware of the moment-to-moment -moment reality that you live in. You can come to see how you are in the world through a completely different lens. One that will empower you to make better decisions. And it will empower you to be a better human being. And it will empower you to help others flourish. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can take this first step to being awake. I'm going to show you the way to get on the path to an intentional life. A life focused on being a better human being. And who or what you are right now doesn't matter. It is how you are right now and how you want to be that matters. How are your relationships with yourself, with others, and with the world you live in? Can you imagine how those relationships can be improved? Well, let's start out a little about myself. Uh, first, like you, I'm a human being. We're all human beings here. I was born to a fairly well-to-do family. Well, it's true that I was what some of you would consider a prince. Hey, my life seemed good. I got a high-level education, you know, for my own time and culture. I had a fine horse. I got a wife, beautiful baby boy. I was trained as a warrior. I was trained as a scholar. But something was missing. I felt an emptiness. Now, chances are you felt a similar sort of emptiness. Now, thinking I needed some me time, you know, to, to figure out what was going on. So I left my home. I discarded my fine clothes. I left behind my wife and boy. I left behind my horse. And I started wearing cast off clothing from a charnel pile. And then I set off into a world that I was ignorant of. Because let me tell you now, what I thought was reality, it wasn't even close. I had no idea what was going on outside the walls. There were people starving because nobody seemed to care. There were people that were maimed and ill and no one seemed to care. There were people dead and putrefying right in the street. Family and friends wailing and crying around their bodies. Nobody seemed to care. Now I'll admit to you that this suffering was all a big shock to me. I felt the arising of compassion and I wondered if others felt the same way. And I was compelled to look deeper into this suffering that human beings endured. And it came to me like a flash. I was sure that the holy Brahmins, they knew about this. And they had a plan to alleviate this suffering that I've suddenly realized. And with that idea in mind, I went off to study and practice with some of the finest teachers I could find. Brahmin Arata Kalama, he taught me about the Atman, this eternal soul. And the guru, Udraka Ramaputra, he connected the soul and karma and morality into lessons and taught me those. And I read the Vedic scriptures. And I looked at the Vedic practices. And they had a lot to offer. 
But there was nothing about this overall human suffering. And I went to the Jains. And the Jains, they taught me non-action. Non-action as a way for my soul to attain bliss. And I thought, non-action and the alleviation of suffering? That didn't really seem to connect very well for me. Finally, I said, you know what? I'm going to live as an aesthetic. I'm going to do this for six years. Live with almost nothing. And I ended up nearly starving myself to death. I was lucky. This young woman, her name was Shujata, uh, she found me on a stream bank and she brought me some rice and had a little milk in it. And after eating it, I realized two things. There are compassionate people out there and starving myself just wasn't working. I'd had the experience of being a pampered son of a rich and powerful man. And I had denied myself to the other extreme. And I found that neither was useful in answering the question of suffering. So the Brahmins, the Hindi teachers, the Jains, and the aesthetics weren't able to tell me anything. So, what was left? Me. I hadn't tried relying on myself to find the answer. Coming across this beautiful pipa tree, I sat down in its cooling shade, and I made a decision. I thought, you know, I'm going to sit here for as long as it might take. I'm going to try being mindful of how I was, how the world was, and how I wanted both to be. You know, I understand, talking to some folks today, uh, that they call this mindfulness meditation now. Seems like an appropriate name. But it took hours, commitment, and effort before I had my personal aha moment. And today, here, Buddha Center, Second Life, here in the Deer Park, I offer you the opportunity to have that same experience. So I told you, I was sitting under that Bodhi tree, and I became awakened. But, you know, you'd be right to ask, just what was I awakened to? I came to the realization that there are two extremes of living that you've got to avoid. One, Ease up on the sensual pleasures. Now, I don't mean you shouldn't enjoy a meal or you shouldn't enjoy a glass of wine or a movie. Just don't let the pursuit and indulgence control your existence. Don't become so attached to the temporary feelings that pleasures induce because that could lead to craving them when you don't have them. And second, don't deny yourself the basics of life, or you're not going to have the energy to find the path. So just avoid extremes. And I decided I'd call that the middle path, avoiding extremes. To be a human being is to suffer. That got your attention, didn't it? it? It sure got mine. You know, I and all of you are human beings, and we're each going to suffer disillusionment, illness, unsatisfactoriness, discontent, anguish, and of course, death. In this ennobling truth, we are all the same. This is a reality that you must be mindful of and accept before any further action can be taken on the path. You know, I once sent a woman out to collect a mustard seed from every home in her village that had not been visited by any sort of suffering. And the proof of suffering is the fact that when she came back, there was no mustard for hot dogs that day. We suffer because we get attached and that leads to craving. Hey, when material ideals, or excuse me, when material possessions, or even your ideas, or the people around you, and even yourself, change, well, we can find that hard to accept. We can develop cravings for sensual pleasures, and these are pleasures that don't last. And we pursue things we think we want, 
and we get them, and we feel, well, that's not enough, or they don't last. This leads to suffering. Suffering, though, can be alleviated. That's good news. There has to be an effort to apply rigorous self-honesty and become aware of what causes suffering a commitment to accept our part in those causes, and the will to take the actions necessary to alleviate suffering in ourselves and in others. And it is a reality that suffering can be alleviated. My experience showed it. Your experience can show it. But did you notice that there's kind of a pattern in these first three ennobling truths? Walk the path must be realized. Become aware. Accept our part. Take the actions. These are all self-initiated behavior. Self-help. What I became awakened to is a true self-help philosophy. Only you can do it for yourself. Now, the great thing about being human beings is that we're empowered to take the needed steps on the path. And I say we because each of us, we're all human beings. And like me, you just need to learn the path, and then you've got to make some effort to walk it. I did it. And so can you. There is a fourth aspect of the ennobling truths, and that's the ennobling eightfold path. This is one of experiencing reality through your own efforts. Ennobling is used because it's the best way that I've discovered to avoid the dangers of craving sensual pleasures and to find the realization that all things are impermanent. You know, there is no permanent self. And that for everything, there is cause and effect. And these things, when we come to understand them and accept them, they ennoble us. They empower us. And these are realizations necessary for a path of intentional living, of service to yourself and to your community. You've got to commit yourself to a practice that will lead to the cessation of stress and unsatisfactoriness. And that is the ennobling eightfold path Right view, intention, speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. A view that does not fear seeing phenomena as they are. Intention directed toward doing what is useful and productive in all situations. Speech that promotes harmony. Action taken that promotes human flourishing. Livelihood that contributes positively to the universe. Effort made to improve your own personal character and the state of the world around you. Mindfulness that what you do matters. Concentration on the positive aspects and actions of moment-to-moment -moment experience. These are the guides on the ennobling eightfold path. I understand now that uh, the middle path is called Buddhism. It's an interesting choice. And that I am now called the Buddha. And that seems a little pretentious, but hey, whatever works for you works for me. Whatever you call it and however you practice it, religion or philosophy, it doesn't change the core goal of the alleviation of suffering through the realization of the four ennobling truths and the practice of the ennobling eightfold path. It also doesn't change the fact that I'm a human being and I was awakened. You are human beings too and you can be awakened.